routine that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. More of you, God. More of you, God. Father in heaven, you're awesome, you're magnificent, and you're worthy to be praised. God the Father, we love you, we praise you, we magnify you. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for your great sacrifice. We thank you that our names are imprinted upon the palm of your hands. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come now and minister to us, Lord. Lord, let the word of God and the Holy Spirit meet here tonight in this place, in our hearts. Let those two things intersect, Lord. The work of your Holy Spirit and the scriptures. And Father, we'll leave here full, filled and overflowing 
because we've met with you. So, Lord, we love you and we praise you. And we ask you, Lord, as as Zechariah said in chapter 4, verse 6, not in our own might, not in our own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And now, Lord, we just thank you for this time in your word. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. All God's people said, amen. Amen. May I have a seat? Amen. How's everybody doing tonight? Man, that was a, wasn't that a beautiful time of worship? It's just, you know, the, the busyness of the day. You're frazzled. You've been going all day. You're tired. You've been working. And, you know, you got to get home, get dinner, get things situated. It's great to come into God's house and worship with their brothers and sisters, isn't it? It's a beautiful thing. I love, I love getting together with you guys. I love getting into the Word. I love worshiping. And um, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, way the Holy Spirit ministers to the body of Christ when we gather. And we're very thankful for that. So if you would turn in your Bibles tonight to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're continuing our study on the Holy Spirit. Uh, thank you guys for, for praying for me last week. I came down with a flu last week and it was rough. And, um, but thank you for your prayers and the Lord's help. He brought me right up out of it and I feel great. And I'm very thankful to be standing before you tonight. But I said an eight-week study. Don't hold me to it. It's going to be somewhere seven to ten weeks, seven, eight, nine weeks. We're not in a hurry, right? You know, we're not in a hurry. The rapture hasn't taken place yet, so we still got more time to study the Word of God and get into fellowship and grow, grow in our relationship with the Lord. That's what we're here, that's what we're here for, is to fall in love with Jesus more, be more led by the Holy Spirit, and to have fellowship with, with each other in a deeper and greater measure. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm, I'm going to read uh, the first nine verses, and then we'll pray. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 says, Now concerning spiritual gift, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are a variety of ministries in the same Lord. There are a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another, faith by the same Spirit, and to another, the gifts of healing by one Spirit. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, as we study these nine verses, actually eight and a half verses tonight, we're not going to get to the very last gift that we talked about, but these first three gifts, Lord, I pray, Lord, as we, as we talk about them and discuss them, Lord, that we'll have a clearer understanding when we leave here tonight, understanding from your word the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. All God's people said... Amen. Amen. So what did we talk about week one? Just a little recap real quick. Week one, we talked about the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity and the personality of the Holy Spirit, how he is a person. He's dwelling on the inside of you. When you became a born-again Christian, the Holy Spirit took up residence in your heart, and he is dwelling. This person called the Holy Spirit is dwelling on the inside. That's what we talked about week one. Week two, we talked about what the Holy Spirit does in the world. Remember what he does in the world? He's convicting the world of what? Sin, righteousness, and judgment, according to uh, John chapter 16. And then week three, we talked about 15 ways the Holy Spirit operates in our life. And I really, that was just a peruse through the New Testament where it talks about all the different actions and all the different things that the Holy Spirit does in our life. And if you missed it, you can go on our Facebook page or our YouTube page and go back and look at week three of the Holy Spirit. And then two weeks ago, we, looked at, uh, we started looking at the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That was week four. And that was from Ephesians chapter four. And what did we talk about? We talked about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And tonight, let's bring up our list. Tonight, I'm just going to talk about those first three on the far left under 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to talk about the word of wisdom the word of knowledge, and we're going to talk about faith. You know, it's amazing. The more you study the word of God, the more you you get out of it. 
the more examples you see in Scripture. So I really believe you're going to be blessed tonight, and I really believe that we're going to have a greater, deeper, solid, biblical understanding of the work of the Spirit as it relates to the uh, word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and faith. But I want to remind you guys, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, and, I've rep- and, I'll, and I'll probably say it a couple more times before the end of the study, what Chuck Smith says about the, the ministries, the, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Keep this in the forefront of your mind as you study them. And that is this. The overarching principle concerning the gifts of the Spirit is this. The true gifts of the Holy Spirit, when manifested in a scriptural and correct way, will always focus people's hearts on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is so true. A gift is not meant to lift up Michelle. It's not meant to lift me up or, or Kate or anybody else up. It's meant to be used within us, within the body, to minister to other people, to put the focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that's one of the signs of a spirit-filled church, is that everything that the spirit is doing in the church, he's pointing people to Jesus, always. Never pointing them to the pastor, never pointing them to the denomination, but, but he's pointing the people to Christ. That's the key principle of the Holy Spirit. You know, many well-meaning churches try to come up with ways to build the kingdom. And there's always this temptation to follow the latest fad. But this begs the question, who sustains the church? Who sustains the body of Christ? The Lord Jesus Christ, by his mighty right hand and by his Holy Spirit, he holds us together. Man, without the Holy Spirit, man, we would fall apart. We would be a train wreck. It's because of him working in us that he holds us together. Uh, it's, it's him. What is our part? What, what, is my, what is my part, Pastor, in building the kingdom as it relates to the Holy Spirit? Simply two parts. Obey the scripture and follow where the Holy Spirit leads you. And let the, let the Spirit use you. You know, God wants to use each and every one of us. And as we dive into the scriptures, I, I, I truly believe that spiritual growth, there's this dynamic that takes place in the center of our being when the word of God and the Holy Spirit come together and they just work mightily in our life and it's it's above and beyond our measure it's an amazing walking in the power of the holy spirit ministering in the power of the holy spirit it's very effective in our witness so let's take a look at it guys first corinthians chapter 12 verse 1 says now concerning spiritual gifts brethren i do not want you to be unaware the spirit was very active in the early church But evidently at Corinth, there was confusion, there was abuse, and there was probably some neglect. There was some neglect concerning the gifts of the Spirit. There was probably some misunderstanding. There was probably some charismania, you know, people going too far extreme. There was probably some people that were ignoring the gifts. We're not exactly sure, but they weren't getting it right. So Paul's writing this corrective letter to explain to them um, about the gifts And unfortunately, today, we see in the body of Christ, there's still a lot of misunderstanding concerning the gifts. We need to remember this, and it's written in our book, that the gifts were meant to unite the body of Christ, okay? The Holy Spirit and his gifts are meant to unite us, but unfortunately, in some circles, they've divided us. There's two extremes. That word that um, the NASB in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 He uses the word unaware. Some of your translations will say not understand or or ignorant. The Greek word is agoneo, and it means to be ignorant, to to not understand, to not have a doctrinal understanding of what the gift means and, and how it operates because God has laid it out in his word how it operates. But the two two opposing sides, not opposing sides, but the two abuses or the two neglects, or the two unawares, you would have, you know, charismania. Charismania is where, is, where, is, is where there's no careful examination to see if what is being said or done aligns with Scripture. Everything that's said and done in the church should be examined carefully by the Scripture. Things need to be done biblically. And they need to be done in order. And sometimes people can get caught up in emotions and get caught up in feelings and say things or do things that aren't biblical. 
And that's caused a divide within the body of Christ. But then on the opposite side, you have the charisphobia. You have the charisphobia. And just the mention of tongues, just the mention of the sign gifts, and people go running for the door. Okay? Family, we, 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 got, to, we got to meet at the Word. We got to meet at the Scriptures. And where the word, what the Word teaches is what we stand on. And we, we can't go to, to the extreme left or the extreme right. You know, Christianity is like you're going down a road. And you have a ditch on the left, you have a ditch on the right. You know, I consider, you know, five-point Calvinism a ditch on the left. And I, 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 and I consider hard-line Arminianism a hard ditch on the right. You know, I can, I can prove both from Scripture. And so I think as you go down the road of Christianity and you serve in the Lord, you know, I firmly hold to the sovereignty of God and, 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 and his majesty and his glory and his eternal power and his sovereignty over, over everything. But at the same time, I hold to man's responsibility too. There's this tension. There's this tension in Scripture we need to hold. And it's the same thing can be said of the gifts. The same thing can be said of the gifts. We need to be balanced, biblical, and do it in order so that we can minister to one another. Uh, so, so verse 1 there, I don't want you to be unaware. I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to understand these things. Look at verse 2. He says, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. I love this statement here. Because Paul is talking to these, these believers at Corinth. And he says, you know what you used to worship before God, don't you? You used to worship those statues. You used to worship these idols, these stone figures. And those stone figures don't talk. Those stone figures don't talk. They don't speak. They have no doctrine. They're dumb. And he says in verse 2, he says they're mute. But not, it is not that way with God. Not with the Lord God Almighty, the true and living God, the creator of the universe, the author of the Bible, our, our, our God and Father, God the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, they are speaking today, and they are speaking loud, and they are not like any stones or buildings. This, this uh, stand right here, it will not talk to me. No matter how much I talk to it, no matter what I do, no matter, no matter how many times I spin it around, it's just a piece of material, uh, physical property. Not so with God. He is the true and living God and the creator of the universe. And he is speaking unlike those mute idols that they were following before they came to Christ. How does God speak? How does God speak? Number one, he speaks through creation. Psalms chapter 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night unto night they display knowledge. So our God, the true and living God, the creator of the universe, he is speaking throughout the world, throughout all of creation. Secondly, he speaks through his word. He's given us this beautiful book called the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable. It corrects us, it rebukes us, it trains us, and it trains us in righteousness. But now as he's talking about gifts here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, now he's saying, not only does he speak, not only does God speak through creation and through scripture, but he reveals his will and, and, and empowers the church through the gifts. Through the gifts. And, and we're not led astray by mute idols. We don't pray to a God who does not speak. You know, that's why we, when we pray, we need to seek the Lord with all of our heart and ask God to answer Seek an answer and trust him that he will answer, that he will meet us. He'll either say yes, no, or wait. But it's very important that we understand that, that God is not mute. Our hearts have to be open, open to his Holy Spirit and open to his word as we see all of his glory in creation. Look at verse 3. Verse 3. And what Paul's doing here, he's, he's building this case on the Corinthians. He's talking about, he's taking them from their former religion, which the mute idols didn't speak at all, to, to the operation and the gifts of the Spirit within the body. So look at verse 3. He says, Therefore I make known to you 
that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The evidence of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, one of the very, very first evidences of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, in us is that he gives us the ability to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. I remember before I became a Christian, I saw all these signs. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. It didn't mean nothing to me, to be honest with you. I didn't understand it. Okay, Jesus is Lord. What's the what? Who cares, you know? I saw signs. I saw gospel tracts. But it wasn't until I became a born-again Christian and I understood salvation and I understood my sins were forgiven and I understood not only did he die on the cross, but he's the creator of the universe. All of a sudden, I was like, Whoa, Jesus is Lord. He is Lord God Almighty. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And the Holy Spirit gives us a passion. Okay? He moves us from long-faced religion to joy and excitement in serving Jesus our Lord. Knowing that today, tonight, this very moment, There's a place above called the third heaven where Jesus Christ is Lord and he's ruling and reigning in heaven. And I'm still alive and I get to trust in him. You know, Jesus is Lord. The Holy Spirit brings a passion and a zeal to that phrase, to that very phrase that Jesus is Lord. When you say that Jesus is Lord, he's your curiosity, he is your sovereign Lord and creator of your life. It's a consuming passion. You know, you want truth and you want Christ and nothing else will suffice when it comes to serving Christ. And you understand that, man, I'm no longer serving man. I'm no longer serving rocks. I'm no longer serving statues or, or, or people, but I'm serving the true and living God who is Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ is Lord. And you can't say he's accursed. That's something the Holy Spirit will not do. Uh, Verse 4. Here we go. We're going to start getting closer to the gifts. Verse 4 says, um, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are a variety of ministries and the same Lord. There are a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things and all persons. Now there's two different interpretations of this verse. Some people use this verse, and really it's divided down the middle. Some people use verses 4 through 6 to um, categorize the gifts. In other words, you have gifts, you have ministries, and you, and you have offices. But the thing I want to point out to you in the text is, and I put verses 4, 5, and 6 up on the screen together so you can see all three of them at the same time. So if you can see those three phrases that are repeated. Look at the three phrases that are repeated. He says there in verse 4, there are a variety of gifts. Verse 5, there are a variety of gifts. Verse 6, there are a variety of effects. So what, what I believe he's talking about here, you could categorize the, the gifts if you wanted to, and I, and I know many pastors who do that, but I want to look at these three words in these three verses as we look at, the, and let's talk about the gifts. But in verse 4, he said, now there are a variety of gifts. That word gifts is charisma. It simply means a gift of grace. And what you need to understand when you, when you see that phrase gift there is that this is not a natural gift, okay? This, this is not, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit is not necessarily something that you were born with, okay? You, you could have had, there could have been some foundation laid early in your life, but these are gifts that the Holy Spirit supernaturally imparts into your life after you become a born-again Christian. You know, and I, I, I believe you know, a person gets saved, they surrender their life to Christ, they're completely filled with the Holy Spirit, they have 100% of the Holy Spirit in them, they're completely sealed and dwelled. But I believe subsequent after that, that the Holy Spirit can come along and give believers gifts. He can give believe, believers gifts for ministry that they did not have before they became a Christian. You know, and that's something that you have to ask the Lord yourself. 
You have to seek God and say, Lord, what is the gift? What is, what is the calling? What is the supernatural ability that you've given to me, given to me to minister to the body of Christ? So that's the, the word gifts is used in verse 4. Then if you look down at verse 5, he uses the word ministries. And this word ministry, the Greek word is deonicus. It's the same word that we use for deacon. Same word that we use, it's the same root, it comes from the same root word that's used for deacon in the Bible. And the ministries, these are gifts, these gifts are given. They, they, they are not for yourself. They're not to build up your name. They're for you to exercise within the body, to build the kingdom, to make disciples. They, they, they're, they're not a badge. They're, they're not a title. They are a tool for ministry. So here we have these first verses. You have a gift, a, a charisma that's, that's been given to you by the Lord. And now you use that gift within a ministry. That ministry could be within the local church, working with children's ministry. That ministry could be street evangelism. That ministry could be anywhere there's ministry taking place in the name of Christ. It could be in the church, it could be in the home, or it could be um, volunteering somewhere in the name of Christ. So there's, there's ministries. So we have a gift, we have a ministry. Well, what happens when you use your gift in a ministry? What, what do we hope happens? We hope an effect takes place. Look at verse 6. Look at verse 6, and you'll kind of see where I'm going with this. He said, that after he says gifts and ministries in verse 4 and 5, in verse 6, there are a variety of effects. This Greek word for effects here is energemia. It means what is worked out or energized. God provides the gift and the power. Now, look at this, guys. Look at the end of verse 6. God, it says in the end of verse 6, God who works all things and all persons. Look at that phrase. Let's look at it one more time. God who works all things and all persons. What's he saying there? This is huge. God is in it all. Okay? God is in it all. God is in you. He's in the gift. And he's in the effect. That's how God works. That's God's sovereignty. That's God's master plan. It's, it's not like you got your gift and like, well, I hope this works, you know, or I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wing it. No. God has given you a gift, verse 4, to operate in a ministry, verse 5, so that there will be an effect, verse 6. So he's saying that you can't exercise gifts and do ministry and have an impact without the Holy Spirit. Okay? Keep this verse that we're studying in the context of the chapter of the, of the gifts of the Spirit. So do you see how important the Holy Spirit is? The Holy Spirit is so important in our ministry. Man, I got to have the Holy Spirit leading me and helping me along the way as I teach the scriptures on Sunday morning. I have to. You know, the children's workers leading the children's ministry classes, they got to have the Holy Spirit. They need to be operating in their gift, in their calling, and street evangelism. I mean, I'm talking any ministry. we got to have the Holy Spirit. We can't do it in our own might or our own strength, or we'll burn out. We'll burn out. We don't want to burn out. Let, man, the Holy Spirit is God. His strength is limitless. His power is, is unending. He is awesome, and he will never, ever be exhausted. So what, what that tells me is I got to trust in him and not trust in myself and let him, as he says there in, in verse 6, uh, the God who works all things in all persons through our gifts, through the ministries, so that there is an effect. Let's look at verse 7. Verse 7, he says, But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So what he's saying here is, whatever gift you do have, whatever gift is manifested in your life, it's not to put you on a pedestal. 
is not to put me on a pedestal. It's for the common good. It's for the common good. If God has given you a gift to evangelize, is to win those souls to Jesus. If he's given you the gift of encouragement or giving or any of the other gifts that we're going to talk about in the next couple weeks, he's given it for you to use it, to use it within the body of Christ. You know, um, sometimes some of the most important ministry uh, takes place at Calvary. Don't get me wrong. The word is supreme here, and I love the teaching of the word. And I feel like it, it is the highlight of my Sunday morning when we're getting into the word together. But let me say something, though. Some of the most important ministry takes place before and after church, right here in the, in the hallways. When church left out 45 minutes ago, and they're still over there having fellowship, and they're still over there praying. And, you know, I look at that, and I'm like, man, that's Holy Spirit time there. I ain't touching that. Y'all stay there as long as y'all need to. You know, or, or whatever. But those are valuable, valuable times where believers get to use their gifts. So never underestimate um, coming to church early and staying a little bit late. Exercise your gift, you know, and, and be used for his glory. Verse 8. Verse 8. Actually, verse 8, here's our first gift. He says, For one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Now, what is the word of wisdom? What is the word of wisdom? The word, it's a word given that offers a solution to a challenge that is faced. It is one of those, oh no, what do we do moments. It is that when the pressure is on and we don't know what to do. It's a supernatural word given to solve a difficult situation. I will read the passage or you can also turn in your Bibles now to Acts chapter 6. I'm going to give you, I'm going to, Read to you Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. And Chuck Smith in his book, Living Waters, he uses this as an illustration to describe um, a word of wisdom. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 5 says, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task, but will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurius, uh, Nicanor, T Timon, Parmenius, Nicholas, and a proselyte from Antioch. So what we have here is shortly after the church was born, you have Hellenistic Jews, which were Jews outside of Palestine, and then you had the, the uh, Jews in Palestine. Well, they both had widows. And, and the, the Hellenistic Jews' uh, widows were not being taken care of. So they went to the disciples and said, Hey, we got a problem. We got, these, we got these widows not being taken care of. And so it's like they went to the disciples, they went to the pastors, they went to the leaders and said, hey, we, we got a problem. Y'all need, need to come take care of these widows. But they were like, no, our, our ministry and our job is to preach the word. So Chuck Smith points out in his book that through the disciples, this word of wisdom came to appoint deacons to take care of the Hellenistic uh, Jewish widows so that the problem could be solved. And I believe, I, I totally agree with him and agree with that, that, that it's, the, it's when we get ourselves into a situation and we need help, you know, and, you know, Lord, what do you want us to do in this situation? We're, we're, we're facing a difficult, challenging situation. We're not sure what to do with the service, you know, um, Last week, I believe, I, I believe Andy gave me a word of wisdom a week and a half ago. I, uh, I called Andy and I said, hey, man, um, I'm not feeling good. I, I, I come down with a flu. What should we do about Wednesday? You know, and um, and I, I just wasn't sure. We weren't sure what to do with, with, with Wednesday night service, but we knew how important it was. And, um, and so Andy called me up Sunday night and said, uh, hey, man, um, why don't why don't you just let me and Bud 
uh, put together a Wednesday night service, and we'll have the church read scripture and pray together and have some testimony. And as soon as he said that, I was like, that was a great idea. That was a great idea. I believe that was a, a word of wisdom from the Holy Spirit because we, we had a situation. What were we, what were, what were we going to do for fellowship on Wednesday night? And I was clueless. I wasn't sure because my head was spinning from the flu I had going on. But Andy stepped in and said, hey, pastor, let's do this. And I was like, that is perfect idea. Praise the Lord. So that's the word of wisdom. I believe the Holy Spirit uses words of wisdom to help the body to solve difficult or challenging situations. You know, it's not just a matter of what does the pastor say, but it's what does the Holy Spirit say. You know, what, does, what, what, what do we feel like the Lord is leading us to do in this situation that we're facing? It could be something minor, like a Wednesday night service. It could be something big, like a purchase. It could be a big decision about leaders or positions. Or, or it could be a, a whole number of things. You know, I don't, I don't have a magic ball, and I don't believe in any of that stuff. But we don't know what the future holds. But we serve a God who does. We serve a God who knows the future, and we have to look to him and, and pray and seek him and ask him to give us in situations like this a word of wisdom. Words of wisdom are problem solvers. Words of wisdom are answers to prayer. Words of wisdom, they give us direction and they give us guidance. And there's something about... Um, unity within the body, within the leaders, that, you know, me and the elders, we get together, we talk about ministry, and we put our heads together, and we ask the Lord to speak to us and challenge each other and build this thing up, and he does a wonderful job at it, I believe, in our meetings as we sit and we talk about ministry, and we're open to all the ideas and discussions. So let's look at the next one. The next one's in the same verse. That was a word of wisdom. Which, by the way, wisdom, you know what wisdom is. Wisdom is the art of skillful living. It's applying God's principles to our life. It's, it's, it's living smartly, living by the scripture. Um, that's a wisdom, really a definition from the book of Proverbs. But this specifically, this gift of wisdom, as I said, is a problem solver. It's helping the church make decisions. The next one there, he says, And to another, the word of knowledge. The word of knowledge, according to the same spirit. What is a word of knowledge? It is information a believer receives supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. And there was no other way of finding out. There's no other way of finding out. Peter exercised this gift in Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, you can turn there if you like. Um, but in Acts chapter 5, the scripture says, but a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself. With his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And he, he heard those words. Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard of it. Peter had no way of knowing of their deception. They were putting on a front. They wanted to make them think they were giving all their money. They sold their property. They gave all their money. And they, and, and, but there was one person they didn't fool, and that was God. And what does the Holy Spirit do? He brings judgment. He brings judgment through this word of knowledge. That's pretty powerful, family. That's pretty powerful. Um, wow. 1992, I came to Christ. And for my first year as a Christian, my first 12 months as a Christian, there was a sin I really struggled with. And it, it was a it was a, it was a sin. It was a, really a spiritual warfare that I was going through. And I 
started going to this church. I met all these Christian friends, but I didn't tell nobody. I, it, was my, it was a spiritual warfare that I was going through, this psychological spiritual warfare thing that I was having a very difficult time with. It was really shaking me, and it was kind of rocking my faith. And, um, but I went to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, and I never told no Christians because I didn't want them to think I was weak. You know, I want to be Super Dave. You know, I want to be super strong. You know, I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to convey no weakness. I was a young Christian. I didn't know any better. And uh, so for a year, I, I, I had this spiritual warfare, this attack I was going through, and I had a difficult time shaking it. And then one Thanksgiving, I went over to my friend, let me back up, six months before that, my friend Chris, who was part of our little Christian Bible study group, he moved off to Belgium. He went off to school in Belgium. So I hadn't seen him for six months. And then uh, I went over to my friend Joseph's house on a Thanksgiving that year, 93, whatever year it was, 93, I believe. And, uh, and Joseph's like, man, I just got a postcard from Chris. And I said, let me see it. I opened up this postcard and I read it. And Chris said, David, I just had a flash. Ignore the voices that doubt. They come from the father of lies. And then he laid out exactly. This wasn't generic. Oh, you're just struggling in life. You just, you just got this little sin in your life. He laid out exactly what I was dealing with. And I was like, whoa. God knows what is going on. My friend Chris I believe, had received a word of knowledge. And guys, it just melted my heart in faith. My heart was in repentance before the Lord. I was like, God, you truly see. You truly see what's going on, and you truly care about me. You know, uh, and it, it just it brought victory because of this word of knowledge. This, this word of knowledge, uh, now, be careful. You know, um, when we talk about spiritual gifts, we talk about words of wisdom, we talk about words of knowledge. You know, Chuck Smith would say the same thing. I remember reading it in his book. You know, when somebody gives you a word of knowledge or somebody gives you a word of wisdom, you know, the best thing to do with it, hold it right here next to your heart. You know, pray. Seek the Lord. Ask for confirmation. You know, um, Make sure it's biblical. Make sure it's solid. You know, but, but do trust and believe and know that God can work through words of knowledge as long as they're legit and they line up with the word of God. And his, there was no way, there was no way my, my friend Chris could have nailed it down like he did. But he did. It was because God gave him a word of knowledge. Also keep in mind, many times a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom can come through the teaching of the word. It can come through the teaching of the word. The pastor teaching from the scripture can prophetically speak into a believer's situation. I've had people come up to me after service here at Calvary Chapel Irma, right here in the sanctuary, and say, hey, pastor, you nailed exactly what I was dealing with this week. Thank you. And I say, praise the Lord, man. You know, it's not me. I didn't know what you were going through. I didn't know what was going on, man. I'm just studying the word and just teaching it. But the, the Holy Spirit operates that way. He operates within the teaching, of the teaching ministry of the word and in the church. Another reason God gives us words or wisdom or words of wisdom or knowledge is so that we will pray for whoever or whatever it pertains to. God can give you a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge so that you will pray that you will seek the Lord for your brother or sister or for whatever situation that, that, that may be coming their way. You know, so words of wisdom, words of knowledge, is, they can cause us to pray and intercede for people. That's very, very important that these, the, these gifts, these gifts serve a purpose, they serve a reason to build us up, to, to, to let us know that God is working to, to minister to one another, to help each other. I doubt very seriously any of us has it 100% to, all together, because I don't. And that's why I need you. 
And hopefully that's why you need me. And hopefully that's why we need each other, so that we can build each other up with words of knowledge, words of wisdom, as the Spirit enables us. Let's continue verse 9. Verse 9, we're going to talk about faith. Verse 9 says, And to another faith by the same Spirit. Now, what faith is he talking about here? This faith, is, this faith given by the Holy Spirit enables the believer to trust God in difficult and demanding situations. It is the ability to trust God and trust him in the face of overwhelming obstacles and insurmountable odds. The gift of faith is primarily expressed toward God through prayer, appealing to and trusting God will do that which is beyond which is beyond his normal provision, okay? In other words, this is big faith. This is big faith. This is this faith he's talking about in verse 9. This is this is more than saving faith. This is more this is more than just trusting in Christ. This is more than believing faith. This is more than just taking God at his word. As Sandy Adams says, this is giant slaying faith. This is mountain moving faith. This is the faith of Noah. This is the faith of of Daniel in the lion's den. And again, it comes by the Holy Spirit. Okay? The Holy Spirit just rises up, wells up within you, and gives you the ability to trust the Lord for a, a situation that seems insurmountable. Like, like it, it seems like there's, 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 it just seems like there's no answer. There, there, there's no solution. But we trust God and his spirit gives someone the gift of faith to trust them for a situation that's outside of their control and that's most likely not going their way. Now, I could give you some examples from Scripture, but I got permission from two people yesterday to share with you an example of this faith talked about in verse 9 that happened right here at Calvary Chapel Irmo this past August. So I would like to share with you guys some text messages that took place this past August. On August 11th of, of 2021, we gathered out there in the foyer here at Calvary Chapel Irmo on a Wednesday night to pray for Carmen Greenlee. She was hospitalized with COVID, and the situation was very, very serious. And she declined very, very rapidly. It was a very scary situation. And I just copied this off my text. On August 18th, I relayed a text from Carmen to the family here, and I quote, Carmen is still on the respirator at 55% oxygen. She is struggling with going back to breathing on her own. An hour later, Jeanette responded on August 18th, quote, continuing to believe God for a miracle. That's all she said, continuing to believe God for a miracle. That same day, um, I re- Leslie sent me a text. I related to y'all, and in that text, I said this. Carmen was taken off the respirator but she started having issues. She is back on the respirator and sedated. Jeanette responded in this text, God is working. That same day at 5 p.m. on August 18th, uh, Jeanette said, Jeanette texted, I'm praying that she will come off the respirator either today or tomorrow. And I was like, amen, amen. Now, but it didn't look that way in the natural realm. But you know what? I, I agree with my sister. I agree. And I'm just going to praise the Lord in the storm. And, but, but Jeanette was like, she, she, she had to, I believe she had this gift of faith we're talking about in verse 9. Because then on the very next day, August 19th, I texted you guys and I said, let's continue to pray for Carmen. Irene and I are lifting her up also. Here's my update from Leslie. Carmen had a bad turn this morning. Her O2 levels had to be turned up, and they were doing a bronchial scope and a possible CT. If they don't find anything, the outlook is grim. 
These are um, Leslie's words. It's an indication that the COVID has damaged her lungs more than they thought, waiting on an update from the doctor. Three hours later, August 19th, uh, 1046 a.m., my text to the church was, the hospital just called. Carmen has irreversible damage to her lungs from COVID. They are keeping her comfortable. Rachel, her daughter, flies in today from Florida, and they will have to make a, a big decision on her care. I know Carmen does not want to continue on life support from the machine. This is heartbreaking news for Carmen and I. We share the same blessed hope. This is Leslie speaking. We often talk about how much we are looking forward for that moment. I just thought we would grow old together. The Lord has been kind to me for over 38 years of being with her. Thank you, Pastor David and Calvary Chapel Irmo, for your thoughts and prayers. So I relayed that text to you guys. Jeanette responded that same day, still praying. <laughs> still praying. I was like, wow, praise the Lord. And then radio silence a little bit later, she texted again. Jeanette said on the same day, our God is able. Praise the Lord. And then um, August 21st, update from Leslie. His, mom's in, his mom in Florida passed away, and they are removing the respirator um, they're removing the respirator from her today, from, um, from Carmen today. She's fixing to see the glory of heaven. I, wrote, I, I, wrote, I conveyed that text. And Jeanette responded again, praying for the family. Praying for the family. August 24th, I, I, I conveyed the text to the church. Hey, family, I just got, off, just got back from visiting Carmen. She's at Agape Care Hospice, 141 Stone Ridge Drive, Greystone Boulevard, listed as a miraculous, excuse me, list without a miraculous turnaround. Carmen is preparing to leave this world and go into the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Doctors said she may have about a week. I asked Leslie, and he said, if anybody would like to come visit her, they are welcome. Just want you to be prepared. The sickness has taken a heavy toll on her appearance. She can respond very little, but Leslie and Carmen's daughter welcome visitors. Then on August 31st, Jeanette texted, uh, the Lord gave me Psalms 118, verse 17, which says, I shall not die, but live, declares the works of the Lord. Praise him for his word. That was like on a Monday. She was, they, they, they thought she was going to pass on Friday. And then Wednesday, <laughs> I'm going to try to keep it straight here. Wednesday, uh, Leslie called me. I'm going down I-20. And, and Leslie called me, and he, he, he was in tears. He couldn't hardly talk. And I'm like, what? Did she pass? Did she pass? No. Uh, the doctors just came in and said that uh, her lungs are fine and that it's all gone. And they're, they're expecting 100% recovery. That is faith that I believe that is being talked about here. That our sister Jeanette, that God gave her for that moment, for that time, for that season, to trust the Lord for this supernatural. And despite all the reports, you know, I was just the messenger, she was standing on the scriptures. And she felt the Lord had spoken to her and that, 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 um, that she was that she was that she that um that Carmen was gonna live. And Carmen is doing great today, family. She's doing great. She's back in fellowship. And we we praise the Lord for that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a gift of faith. And again, these these, as the scripture calls them, they're called manifestations. You know, they're, they're, I don't I don't believe there's a a healing doctor walking around who can just go through and heal, 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 or none of that. I don't believe that. But I believe that the Spirit gives this gift as a manifestation to, to bring him glory, to bring God glory. That's the ultimate uh, purpose of all the gifts, is to point people to Jesus. It was not necessarily, yeah, we wanted to live, you know, and we all want to live, but the ultimate purpose 
And that healing or any healing is to point people to the healer, to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not so I can live a long life. You know, even though I want to live a long life and I want to be around for a while. But the ultimate reason in praying for healing is so that Christ will be magnified. So that people will say God is good and the Lord Jesus Christ is the great physician. And again, she's with us now. She's in fellowship. We went out to dinner with them a couple weeks ago, me and Irene. And uh, she is doing wonderful. And we praise the Lord for the, the gift of faith that was given to Jeanette. Um, just want to give you a couple quotes. Listen to what John MacArthur says. This is a wonderful statement he says here on, on these gifts. He says, those with this gift, excuse me, this is, this is his quote on the gift of faith in his commentary. I thought it was pretty good. He says, those with this gift of faith have the special ability to lay claim on the promises of God. Okay, family, we trust the promises of God. We live by the promises of God. But, but, but Johnny Mac here is saying there's something deeper going on. There's something where they, they grab hold a little deeper here and, and they dig deeper. And he says, I quote, according to his own plan and will, faith is a faith that activates God. I found that pretty surprising to be, to be said by Dr. John MacArthur. But that's what he says. It's a supernatural empowerment that the, that the believer's faith by the Holy Spirit, working in conjunction with God and his will, operates in a supernatural and amazing way. Lord, give us faith. Lord, give us faith. You know, that is my prayer. That, 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 you know, we're walking in a, a dark generation right now. We're walking in a very wicked generation right now. But Lord, give us the faith of the disciples. Give us the faith of, of truly born again believers who love God with all their heart. And then Chuck Smith, got, I gotta include another quote from Chuck Smith. Chuck Smith says, uh, talking about the gifts, um, talking about these gifts that we talked about, he says this. This is a beautiful statement. He says, May the Lord fill us with the fullness of his spirit until he flows forth like a gusher of living water from our lives, healing and touching those around us with his unspeakable love. Again, the gift is not about me. It's about, man, who can I touch for the Lord? Who can I encourage? Who can I challenge? Who can I pray for? God, let your Holy Spirit rule and reign in me so that I can touch those around us. That's the gift. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's not to show off or create some kind of show or, 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 or any of that. It's to minister to the body of Christ. It's to get to your heart. It's to get to my heart. It's to get to each other's hearts in ministry. In closing, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11 says, this goes along with what, what, what John MacArthur and Chuck Smith were saying. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11 says, Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let the Spirit flow through you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. I'm just going to pray. Uh, I'm going to pray over our body right now and, just, and pray, for these, pray for these things that we've studied. Father God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. We thank you for this awesome Bible study in your word here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And Lord, I just pray, Father God, as you see fit, as you see fit in your will, in your plan for our body, Lord, that you would use us mightily, Lord, in the areas of words of wisdom, Lord. Give us direction. Give us guidance. Help us to, help us to solve the big questions, the big decisions, the things that we have to plan and, and work around, the things we have to do. Holy Spirit, Spirit of the living God, 
give us wisdom and speak through those as you please, as, as you manifest yourself through words of wisdom. Father, words of knowledge. God, help us in this area, Lord, to grow, Lord God. Let our hearts be open to words of wisdom, to, to words of knowledge, things that will build up the body of Christ, things that will strengthen us, Lord. Help us to grow in the area of words of knowledge. And Father, faith. We, we, we all have faith by trusting in you as our Lord and Savior. But Father, I pray for each and every Christian here tonight that their faith would grow deeper tonight. It may not be this supernatural empowerment of faith, but Father, just a deeper faith that loves you, that trusts you, that obeys you. And Father, we know according to your plan, according to your will, you will give believers that supernatural faith that's talked about here when it's time to stand in the gap for, for someone that's, that, that's lost or something that's not going right. Father, give us faith. Lord, give us faith, give us knowledge, and give us wisdom. And Lord, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for this midweek study. And we just ask you to be exalted because you are a mighty God. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, Father. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Next week, we'll look at miracles, healing, and prophecy.